Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey, what's happening, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Berkelheimer. So today I welcome Mark Vanderwalt to the show. Hey, Mark, what's up, man? Hey, how's it going? Thanks for joining Thank me. For, yeah, thanks. It's an honor to be here. So, uh, it, it's an honor to have you here, Mark. I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, what you and uh, Jake do with, with uh, reef therapy, but uh, we'll uh, dive into all of that. So for, for the folks uh, out there that do not know Mark, Mark has been a reef tank hobbyist for 27 years, right? Uh, something like that. Something like that? That's, yeah. uh, that's kind of like the territory I'm up in. I'm, I'm close to 30 years myself. It might be 30 years. I'm not, not exactly sure. So 27 years is a lot of, a lot of time to be keeping uh, reef tanks. I mentioned uh, Mark is the uh, co-host of uh, the very popular uh, podcast, Reef Therapy. He, um, this is uh, interesting, he was an active member on Reef Central in its early, early years, and he earned Tank of the Month way back in <laughs> 2001. Is that uh, 2001? Yeah. Man. The bar, the bar was much lower that, that <laughs> in the beginning than there. I think, is it started in 2000, I want to say? Did it? Um, yeah. 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 Got to love Reef Central. Um, you also uh, apparently moderated back in the early days on Reef Central as well. I did, yeah, and, uh, for a little bit in the early days. And then uh, when I moved to into a house from an apartment, I didn't have a tank for a couple of years, so I wasn't very active. And, you know, if you don't, if you know, if you're not active, you're not going to stay a moderator for long. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I was okay with that. I wasn't really good at... Uh, uh, dealing out justice. You know, I, I just wanted to talk about <laughs> aquariums. So you didn't want to bust any balls there uh, in terms of people uh, misbehaving on the on the boards. I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in in addition to doing that, Mark also wrote some articles for Reef Central as well as uh, Reef Builders. He's written some articles. He is also, and this is what uh, Mark provided me in his little brief bio, a metal halide uh, reformed metal halide user and recovering SPS addict. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll dive into all that stuff in, uh, in just a minute. But before we start to, uh, to chat with Mark, I do want to thank the sponsors 
for the show, Bulk Resupply and Ecotech Marine. I really appreciate these companies supporting this live stream. And I appreciate all you folks that are uh, tuning in right now to watch this live stream. As always, please feel free to drop your comments in the chat, ask questions, and also don't forget to hit that like button, please, so more people can find the live stream. So, Mark, man, I don't know what we're going to talk about because you and Jake like talk about everything on reef therapy. There's, I'm not sure there's a, there's a topic that uh, has has not been covered by by you guys. You really do some deep dives, and I really do enjoy the um, the chats that you guys have. But um, I don't know, man. Maybe uh, maybe it kind of start. We we uh, briefly touched on your um, your history in terms of you know how long you've been in the hobby, but just give us maybe a quick overview in terms of your uh, reef keeping journey. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I started like most people, freshwater, a kid walking into a, a pet shop and being mesmerized. Um, and uh, that, of course, I think in my around 10 to 13 years of age, I got really into uh, saltwater tanks. My parents let me try a 55 gallon saltwater tank, which was a miserable failure. You know, it was an under gravel filter with crushed coral lots of slime algae. Um, I remember I had a tomato clown that swam in the slime algae like it was uh, an anemone. <laughs> um, so that was a failure. Um, but then um, around 1995, uh, I had that same 55-gallon tank, and I read a, a, a great article by, I think uh, you've had Julian on, right? Yep. Um, and he wrote in one of those annual magazines about just Hey, all you really need for a nice, for a decent reef tank is some normal output fluorescence, a hang on the back filter and some quality live rock. So I gave that another go and that tank was, you know, relatively successful for what it was. So that, that from that, it took off. Um, then, um, that was when I was a freshman in college. So then, uh, I had a little 29 gallon reef tank in college which eventually I think was, I, I got gutsy and submitted pictures to Aquarium Frontiers, I think it was called, the uh, Terry Siegel. Yeah, yeah. And he actually featured it, which was shocking because the, the photography was <laughs> terrible. Um, and then, uh, you know, I got on the forums online and started participating heavily in Reef Central, um, chatting it up there. And then, yeah, you know, graduated, got a job. Um, uh, and then of course went bigger and, and more serious with reef keeping. So, um, yeah, it's been a while, but, uh, you know, it's been a fun journey. So Jake, uh, says, uh, Mark V is my rock and, uh, <laughs> we're getting some, uh, kudos in terms of reef therapy and, and, um, folks looking forward to you being on, um, uh, this live stream and just drilling down a little bit with me. And, um, so let me, um, let me show this um reef central tank of the month and, oh man <laughs> and um i mean you seem to be a little uh you know not terribly proud of the uh of the tank but i mean i gotta i gotta tell you mark it, it to me it looks like it's a uh you know a healthy thriving ecosystem you know there's a, there's some brown corals in there but that's you know back in the day let's call it back in the day in 2001 that's a pretty darn good looking reef tank to me yeah I, when I pulled it up on the way back machine, uh, my first thought is, you know, yelling at my younger self, why didn't you clean the glass, you know, I <laughs> mean, for a tank of the month, I mean, you look at the size in the back and they're pretty dirty. Um, but I mean, we, I was into this whole, um, you know, nature and, you know, let it all, let the, let the ecosystem take hold and all that. So I think maybe, maybe that has something to do with not cleaning the glass so much. Uh, that'll be my excuse. But, uh, it was uh, lit with Iwasaki's and some power compacts that uh, actinics that you couldn't tell if they were on or off because the uh, Iwasaki's drowned them out so much. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but I figure they were adding some extra blue spectrum in there. But yeah. Um, and then of course deep sand beds were were the hot thing back then, right? So uh, lots of that sugar sized uh, sand in there. So one of the things that uh, I, re I read the article and um, one of the things you mentioned is that um, you, you went with um, not a lot of rock, which was really mm -hmm. kind of like the opposite of what a lot of folks did back then, which was, you know, there was like rock walls, right? You had a reef tank yeah. and you usually you put like two pounds per gallon of rock in, in the tank. And it was just like this 
big brick wall and it just, you know, eventually, um, you know, the circulation got choked out. But you, you mentioned in that article that you wanted to go more minimal to allow the, um, you know, to allow for more flow for the, uh, for the corals. You were, you were kind of like, um, you know, a bit of a visionary there, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, powerheads, I, you, you recall this powerheads were terrible back then. We had Maxa jets and, and right. you know, if you were super fancy, you had a red sea wave maker that would turn them on and off and make the impellers rattle. Um, so yeah, I just figured if there wasn't as much rock work, those, uh, those little nozzles could be a little more effective, you know, at, at keeping the flow going. Um, yeah, I, but I've always liked less rock in a tank. I mean, even to this day, I don't, I don't like putting a lot of rock in a aquarium. Um, not that I don't appreciate, um, a really dense tank with a lot of rock work. I think it can look really neat. Um, but, um, and then the other thing is just cost, you know, it, it, it's expensive. Back then it was when it was all live rock at three to four dollars a pound, I think was yeah. what it was going for back then. So, yeah. yeah. And so how did you uh, handle the transition to like more of the modern reef keeping in terms of not starting a tank with live rock and, and going with like uh, dry rock? I, I guess I've never had, I've, the first time I've actually had to do that is this uh, secondary tank I put down in the basement um, because I was always transitioning from one tank to another. So I was already, always carrying over some live rock with me. Um, so I always had a almost like a starter pack of, you know, microbes and bacteria coming along yeah. for the ride. Um, but out of curiosity, I did, um, back in 2018, I did start a tank with some Florida live rock just for, for giggles to see, you know, if I've been missing something and, uh, it was definitely a lot of fun, but after about six to eight months, a lot of the neat stuff sort of whittled away, you know, and I wouldn't say I was any more successful than, you know, having some dry rock and then just having some good rock from maybe somebody else's tank or an old tank of yours that you just seed it with. Um, the one thing I do like is that now that they paint all the rocks or stain them purple, I hated that white Marco rock. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. It's just, it looks horrible for so long. So, and it just seems like it's also an a algae magnet, you know, and yeah. just kind of waiting for something to, uh, to start growing out of that stuff, you know? Um, yeah. in, in terms of my reboot, I'm, um, I'm rebooting the, um, my, one of my tanks with, with, the with dry rock, but I've been cooking it in a Rubbermaid tub for like four months now. So, and, and doing like weekly, um, 10% water changes with like established tank water. So the, um, you know, it's, it's going to be, and I'm also dosing bacteria, so it should be pretty alive by the time oh, I yeah. um, make that transition. And, um, yeah, my one time starting a tank with dry rock was just an epic, epic failure. <laughs> yeah this tank uh down here in the basement is it's um i can't describe it any better than just it's weird i think when you're used to having um some mature rock and i, I mean believe me i've been tempted to move some stuff from the upstairs tank but it's also been interesting to just watch this thing develop it's just it's very unnatural feeling, but the corals look okay, so I'm I'm just gonna roll with it, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, it just I don't know. It's uh, it has just a weird vibe to it. I don't know how to describe <laughs> it. It just feels very sterile. Um, but I don't. Know. So all right, let's uh, let's take a, a look at another um, tank. This is um, I'm calling this the Slimer tank because it's got this gigantic green valley Slimer in the, oh, um, in yeah. the middle of the, uh, the tank. And I just love the, um, the natural mixed reef type of look there, Mark, you know, you've got the big green Valley Slimer that looks like a tire red dragon in the, in the right hand side, another big, um, stag kind of like in the middle, right. And, um, yeah, you know, you just, it's, it's just, there's nothing like looking at a, an established reef tank with mature colonies. Yeah. Yeah. That was probably my 180 near its end of its life, um, uh, which I eventually replaced with a 225 just because the glass was so scratched up and the, the glue, uh, the seams on the sides were looking pretty ratty. And at that point, it, the tank itself was over 10 years old. And I know, I know tanks can last long, but uh, I, I just started to get a little iffy about it. Um, but that, yeah, I think that tank was 
I tried so many different lighting on that tank, and that was uh, my first foray also into LEDs, which I did not like. Um, I Back then, it, I, I said this on the recent Retherapy podcast, you'd have this burn zone where you're, <laughs> you put a coral there and it would just burn uh, you know, it would get bleached or it's just too much going on. And I didn't have a par meter to, uh, confirm this, but then you move it, you know, five inches over and it would brown out. Um, so I started to experiment with fill light with those LEDs. And then eventually I went back to, uh, metal halides on that tank, uh, double ended. Um, what are the Ushio 10 Ks or 14 Ks? I'm not sure. Yep. Yep. Um, um so, and I and I noticed you got the uh, the Regal Angel fish in there, and um, on your current tank you've got a Regal in there too. And we'll uh, we'll take a look at the uh, the current tank. But I also want to dive into um, this is my favorite tank, the uh, the SPS Dominant tank. And so, at what point uh, this is the two twenty five you were talking about? At what point was um, did you have this tank? Yeah. So uh, that last tank, like I said, the tank was starting to look a little bit questionable. Uh, metal halides had melted the cross br- braces, those plastic. All oh, glass. really? <laughs> yeah. And so I was turning 40 and my w- wife's, you know, said, why don't you, you know, get a new tank? So I went as big as I felt comfortable for that space because it's, um, it's above a basement. Um, so I had to reinforce the floors, but I still, you know, just because there were some jacks underneath, I didn't want to go, you know, 400 gallons. Mm. So I went with a 225, which uh, it's like a 180, but it's an extra four inches deeper and taller. Um, and, um, I tried doing halides in a canopy on that tank and it was just such a temperature problem. Um, and you live in Atlanta, and, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that tank, the interesting thing about that tank was that was my, um, well, not my first attempt, but I decided to go with T fives on that guy. Uh, I did an ATI fixture and, uh, my takeaway from that was that it was probably the best light I've ever had for growing SPS, but mm. it was also the most boring quality of light I've ever had. Um, it was just a flat Windex look, uh, but I mean the SPS loved it, you know. So I uh, I kept kept going with it, um, and uh, then that tank went till about 2018 and. Uh, my daughter wanted a pet lizard, <laughs> uh, a bearded dragon, and uh, that room is right off the kitchen. And uh, you know, and then I had my son was you know getting old enough to start playing with toys. So we thought, oh, why don't we make that a playroom and I'll put a reef tank in the basement? But that would mean I'd have to downsize. So I, I sold the 225, which I regret because now the lizard was a big mistake. My daughter got bored with that thing after. A few months. And oh no! You, you broke this tank down for a lizard that is that yeah. lasted just a few months. Really well, it was a playroom plus. Uh, I needed a place to put a tank for this uh, pet bearded dragon, and then six months later, she, you know, I'm the one cleaning up lizard poop, which is nasty. <laughs> um, so we found somebody that was really into reptiles that was happy to take the lizard, and um, at that point, I started uh, plotting to move my tank back upstairs, but. Um, so then I, I downsized briefly to a red sea tank in the basement. Uh, I think it was a 625 XXL. Uh, I don't know how many gallons that is, but I knew that I didn't spend a lot of time in the basement. This was pre COVID. So even though my office where I'm sitting now, I spend a lot of time in cause you know, companies have shifted to remote work yeah. uh, with COVID pre COVID. I was almost never in my basement. So I thought let's not keep high maintenance SPS. Let's just go softies and, you know, keep a few acros. And, and then I ended up really enjoying that tank a lot, which is sort of the trend I'm on now. Cause then when I moved, uh, the reef back upstairs, I continued a bit more on that trend of a mixed reef with uh, a lot more softies so, than there are. So SPS. we're, we're taking a look at the video you shot of the, um, of the current tank right now. And that's a, um, it's a rimless tank, right? Yeah. So I, uh, I got rid of the Red Sea, uh, and like I said, I, I man, if I could have just kept a 225, I would have saved a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I wanted a rimless tank, and um, I guess another shout out to Julian. I really liked um, some videos I saw of his recent or his his current tank where he had the water line a much lower. Um, yes, yeah, so I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, I. 
the the one thing I re- two things I really hate about the Red Sea was the uh, low iron glass seemed to scratch a lot easier. Mm. Um, and I've heard conflicting, uh, you know, counterpoints to that that maybe I'm wrong, but it just in my own experience, I found that it scratched very easily. And then the other thing is if you, I felt like uh, with the water only an inch from the rim, you had to be so gentle with your with everything, with all your maintenance or water would splash over. So I thought, well, it wouldn't be great if the water level was a little bit lower. And then I also had this thought, maybe I would lose uh, less fish to jumping because I was avoiding a lot of wrasses and fishes that I wanted to keep because of that rimless, you know, I didn't want to put one of those mesh screens on there because that's, I don't know, I, I don't think those are very attractive. So, um, and so far... I haven't lost any fish to jumping, so that's good. I did have my swallowtail angel jump, uh, but my daughter was in the room and picked it up and plopped oh, it back in. So that's good. I was more expecting a ras to be the culprit uh, or the victim, I guess. But um, but yeah, so far so good. And I do like the look a lot. It I don't know it. I've seen some Japanese tanks that are like that, and uh, and all I did was ask Planet aquarium to take their rimless 180 and just drop the overflow box a few extra inches and then i asked them to put it in the corner because i hate center rear overflows that you can't maintain yeah yeah i mean one of the things i was going to ask you about having a rimless tank is um you know have you had issues with water splashing over the sides when you're doing uh, maintenance but obviously you answered that question because you had the overflow box uh, moved down and um I, you know i would imagine if you had more flow cranking in that tank Based on what the uh, water line where it, where where it's at right now, it probably wouldn't be too much of an issue, huh? No, no. I know uh, Jake has kept pushing me to put a wave box in there, a Tunzi wave box, uh, and I haven't done that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could you could go to town in there, and uh, you know, there's about three and a half inches of of rim. So that would be I, to me that would be kind of cool. And, and I also have less salt spray. Uh, you know, on my back wall and, um, yeah, I don't know. I just think it's a win-win. I, I like the look of it. Yeah. It looks and great. I, so, yeah. You know, I, um, I always have, um, all my tanks are, are Euro braced and I, and I love the Euro bracing because, you know, I, um, I have SPS dominant tanks and I just have a lot, a lot of flow cranking in there. But, um, you know, I, I obviously, um, so for me, I never thought like a rimless tank would, would make a lot of sense. And I, and I do like a lot of things with the Euro bracing. There's just so many um, positives that um, I could think of in terms, just like even doing tank maintenance or fragging and stuff like that, putting oh, yeah. stuff on top of the Euro bracing. It's kind of like need to have a, uh, have a, uh, have a shelf. Um, but, you know, listen, it's, that's an awesome look. I mean, that, I love the, uh, the open aquascape of that tank and, and kind of like the, uh, the mixed uh, corals you've got in there. Some beautiful clamps. Yeah, they've been, um, I've always had good luck with Duraces and Squamosas, um, Maximas and Croceas are, they're, they're not good for me. <laughs> I can't keep them alive to save my life. Um, but, uh, yeah, the Duraces is a pretty common one. And then, uh, the Squamosa was actually, uh, a gift from Jake, uh, that was at the, uh, Aquatic Expo we were recently at. Biota had it in one of their tanks. Uh, so, uh, he was really nice and bought it for me. And, um, I was a little scared putting a new clam in with an established clam. Mm. Um, you know, I heard, uh, Charles on your talk, talk about, you know, the risks of doing that. And, um, so, but I, I, I was going out of town right after that expo and this tank in the basement only has my lights set to about 90 micromoles of par. And I thought, I, I don't want to put a squamos in there. So, I just uh, I went for it, and so far they're they're both uh, showing good growth on their shell. The white, you know, where you can tell they're putting on new shell. That's the uh, that's the sign. Jake uh, says yeah. your bracing is due for a comeback. <laughs> um, I've go uh, ahead. I'll, no, I was gonna say to your point about having a shelf, you know, and also uh, something for the splashing to bounce off of. Uh, I definitely agree. Um, one other thing I'll say about um, clams is that. Um, I have I have not kept a clam in in um, probably five years. And back when I was first in you know in the hobby, I loved having clams, and I had great luck with clams, no matter what kind of clam it was. You know, maximas, and the only thing I couldn't keep was like a black maxima clam. That was the only clam I couldn't keep. But uh, I used to have these uh, beautiful teardrop 
you know, um, maximum clams and, and, um, squamosas, squamies just like grew like cr crazy. I never had, um, I picked up some, some, uh, cultured, uh, or what a captive raised, uh, blue squamies that never, I never had any luck with, but, um, and that was more recent, but I, for some reason, the last few years, I have not been able to like keep clams successfully. And is that true for your halide tank as well, or yeah. just the LED? Yeah, no, really? halides. I've always, you know, I had great luck with the um, with with keeping them under the uh, halides for years and years. And I haven't even attempted it in my um, my LED lit uh, tank. And I don't know. I'm gun. I'm kind of gun shy about it. I, I guess um, it I, it all depends on, on probably where you find the clams to um, you know to put in the tank. Yeah, I mean, I I suspect that. They, I'm not saying they come from dirty water, but they probably appreciate some dirty water. Yeah. Um, and then, um, I always thought that, uh, I mean, you look at some of the par values that you hear clam folks and anemone folks talk about, and it makes, you know, SPS par numbers, you know, recommended par numbers look like nothing. Right. Um, so I always wondered if, uh, they did better under halides, um, but to your point, you said you've tried it. You ha you have a tank with halides and you have a tank with LED, so uh, that that can't be it. Um, yeah, I tried a blue squammy last year, and uh, there was a failure to launch in that thing. I mean, there was nothing. Never put on new shell, and then eventually just withered away. And it was right next to that deraser that's just growing and growing and growing. So I couldn't explain it. I mean, that's two different species of clam, but you know, you think conditions were good. Um, so I, I, yeah, I wonder if it's also the source, you know, if something's changed in that regard. Yeah. I don't know. You know, I, I think there's, um, what I understood from, from Charles and even Julian, I think clam disease is a, is a real, you know, big issue these days. And, um, perhaps it wasn't as bad years ago. I don't know. Was that a, yeah. uh, was that a blue spotted, uh, squammy that I saw? Yes. That yeah. is an awesome uh, the, looking clam. Yeah, I I I can't get a good picture of it for some reason. So I got to I got to tinker with the lights or something. But yeah, in person it's phenomenal. Um I like it better than the 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 blue squammy that I had last year that looked just like a big maxima, right? Like that thing was beautiful, but um there's something really interesting about this guy with these blue dots all over yeah, it. Yeah, that's uh, so cool. Is that a clam you've had for a long time? No, that was the the Squamy I got from uh, Aquatic Expo from Jake's. That that thing is wow. out in April. Yeah. Wow. That's so, awesome, yeah. man. That's awesome. Um Brymac1 is wondering how does Mark like the Kessel uh, A500X? I love them for nostalgic reasons. Um they remind me of metal halides and I I don't want to get into I know there's a difference between a beam forming light and a point source light and a reflector and I get you know I'm not saying it's the same thing. I'm just saying to my eyes it's like putting I wouldn't say it's the same as putting, you know, a 400 watt um radium in a parabolic reflector i would say it's more akin to uh, double-ended metal halides in terms of light quality you know a little more compact uh in terms of that that spread um i'm also i i like glimmer lines and i'm willing to put up with some harsh shadows in places uh for it you know for that aesthetic so uh, but i i love them i think um if i was going crazy on sbs i'd probably use those as halides and then um, use some LED type strips to do that backfill, and similar to how we used to have halides with actinic VHOs, right? That's how I would how I'd roll with those lights. All right, so you just mentioned if you went crazy with SPS, and I know you guys just dropped another reef uh, therapy uh, session uh, today, and, and you guys talked about this a little bit in terms of um, you know why you're not um, totally gung ho about going SPS dominant again. Man, that was a kick-ass tank that 225 gallon tank i mean that was just the bomb in terms of um you know a beautiful thriving sps tank what um i mean you talked about this briefly in the uh, the reef therapy episode i know some folks mentioned in the chat that they actually um were watching that but um let's let's dive a little bit deeper into that mark 
all right, should I go lay down on the couch and <laughs> like a therapy? Yeah, yeah, how come you guys don't have couches when you're doing these uh, re-therapy sessions there, you know? I mean, you, you guys are in session. But right, who, who actually true. is the uh, the patient and who is the uh, the uh, the therapist in these uh, sessions? Do you guys alternate back and forth between that? No, it's neither. I think it all started... Um, uh, so I've known Jake a really long time. And uh, so whenever I had some passionate thought about reef keeping or something, I would call him up and we'd end up talking for an hour about, you know, anything, you know, reef related. And um, I, I think it was just, and sometimes they would be vent sessions, right? Uh, old man yelling at cloud. <laughs> Cause you know, when you've been in the hobby a long time and then you see something on the internet, you're like, what on earth, you know? And then you, you want to call up the guy that was around back in those days, you know, <laughs> that can relate. Um, and I, I think we just, um, I don't, I don't, Jake may remember differently, but I think we were just thinking, you know, why don't we just record these because, uh, you know, maybe, uh, other people feel the same way, you know? Um, and that was the same with the reef builder articles. I would call him up and have a long diatribe about something and he would interrupt me and be like, why don't you just write it down and I'll put it on reef builders. <laughs> you know? I think he was tired of listening to me, uh, bitch and moan sometimes. So, um, so that, that's how it all started. So, uh, I think we're, we're more therapeutic, you know, like everybody's got a, I hope everybody has a reef buddy that they call up and they can just talk about, you know, harebrained ideas about what to do with their tanks and stuff. And he's always been that for me. So, uh, we just took it and threw it on YouTube and, you know, saw it. Well, let's see if people like it. It's been it. a winning formula. So, um, all right, before we, uh, dig a little bit deeper into the SPS stuff, how did you guys meet you and Jake? Oh, man. So I was going to college. Uh, I, I was living out in Colorado. He was living out in Colorado and I was uh, going to university. And like I said, I had a little 29 gallon, I think it became a 37 gallon cube at some point, but you know, volume doesn't matter. But uh, and he worked at a store down in Denver. I was up in Boulder and, and the Boulder stores at the time weren't all that great. So I would go down to Denver and there was this, this, you know, kid, I guess you could say, I think he was probably like 15, 16, very opinionated, uh, but very smart, you know? <laughs> and, uh, I, I would just go chat with him. Um, and I didn't know him very well. Um, and then I remember they had a big old barbecue cause, uh, with a keg outside and they had just gotten in a bunch of Solomon Island frags from Bob Mankin. And so I went down there and, um, and he sent me home I, with my first SBS and a stick of glue. Um, so anyway, you know, he was the guy at the local fish store I would talk to every once in a while. Anyway, I graduate and uh, I moved to Atlanta, both because I had some family here, but uh, also a job. And, uh, you know, I dragged my reef tank across the country in a U-Haul and, you know, set it up in my apartment. And uh, I'm like, all right, let me go check out the local fish store scene. And I walk into a local fish store and it's the same dude behind the <laughs> counter that was back in Colorado, Jake. And like we... I think we both did a double take at each other. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> um, I believe the owner of the Atlanta store also owned Denver store and had asked him to uh, go to Atlanta and manage the store or something. And so then we just, you know, we started hanging out and talking more and, and uh, staying in touch. So that's how it all started. That's crazy coincidence, man. Crazy. Yeah. But you know what? Yeah. It's, it's a small enough like hobby where that, that stuff is not to totally surprising. Yeah, and he's always been a, a good reef keeping friend in that regard. I um, when I took that two year break because I had just moved into a house and you know I wasn't ready to set up another tank, and then I the minute I was ready to set up another tank, he was going to university in South Carolina, and he made me come up there with coolers, and he just loaded me up with frags, and I you know I didn't buy any coral. I just went home and I had an instant reef tank. So uh, he's always been really generous and uh, like that. So. Yep. So, uh, all right, let's let's uh, let's dig in a little bit in terms of the uh, the whole SPS stuff. So, obviously, you had a um, a talent there for keeping SPS, and um, you know, so your current tank is is uh, I guess you would define it as as a mixed reef. You do have a few uh, yeah. SPS uh, corals in there, but it seems like predominantly softies, you know, in that tank, right? Yeah, yeah. So, what um, what is preventing you from from going back into the whole SPS dominant thing? I mean, nothing. I just, um, I, when I set up that tank in the basement that I knew I would have to neglect, you know, if you set up in a tank in a part of your house, you never go to, yeah. uh, 
you know, I, I automated the heck out of it and I thought, okay, I'll go with easy corals. And I just really enjoyed the flow of the softies, the lusciousness of everything growing into each other. And, um, I mean, you've been in the hobby a long time. There was an era where when I was starting in the hobby, 95, people were skeptical if you could keep Acropora alive. Yeah. Um, then it became this challenge and we were still figuring out how to color them up and how to grow them best. And it was a fun uh, dragon to chase, right? Um, and then I, I'm not trying to put down SBS dominant tanks, but I mean, you know, they do mysteriously croak on you still, right? Yeah. There's still RTN, STN issues. There's there's horrible parasites to deal with. Um, but I feel like we've kind of figured them out. And so to me, they're sort of like any other coral now. You know, they're, they're in my, you know, my upstairs tank is a community tank as we would call it in the freshwater world right where you're you're keeping all kinds of different fish um i just those three acroporas i have in there are just another interesting coral along with the lps and the softies um to dedicate the entire tank to an sps dominant tank I, it's just not on my radar right now um that said, I mean, somebody who really does one of those dominant tanks well, it's mind-blowing, right? Mm. Just to see the variety of colors and the structure that those corals build. And I'll get back into it at some point, but uh, I've just been really enjoying the low maintenance factor and just the lusciousness of, you know, I, I have a porch right off that room, and in the summertime, I just go sit out there and just watching these softies flowing in the current and your fish swimming around, um, and not stressing about, you know, alkalinity as much. And, uh, and when, and the thing about SVS is when they're not doing well, they drive you crazy and you want to pull your hair out, but when they do really well and they grow really big, they're a pain in the butt too, cause you constantly have to prune them. Yeah. And, um, and I, I don't know, it just, um, yeah, uh, there, there's nothing I see online right now, SPS wise that I find particularly exciting. Um, I miss a lot of the old SBS. I miss, uh, I would love to do a really high flow tank with Geminifera and uh, Humulus and something like that, right? Some of those big fat yeah. corn on the cob acros. Um, you don't see them anymore. The D no, uh, I recently saw two on a website that were going for 300 bucks a pop and I, that'd take a lot of money to fill up a tank with yeah. <laughs> those. <laughs> So, um, but it's, you don't even see a lot of staghorns anymore. It's, um, I, yeah. No, that's true. I, um, I love stags. The, uh, the humulus were, were awesome. I remember back like in the early years when, when I was, uh, first getting into SPS and just, uh, you know, when, when, when you bought coral colonies, that was the thing, right? You weren't buying frags, you were buying like whole colonies and I would see these like gorgeous, like blue, dark purple like humulus colonies and you know a lot of times i'd bring those home and and you know they would like just brown out or just crap out on me but i think there was like this one humulus that was like just bright purple and it stayed bright purple in my tank and i was like so jazzed about it and um yeah no it's a whole different uh you know thing in terms of today and frags and the whole rainbow uh tenuous craze and the designer corals you know i um i definitely favor the uh the old school stuff i i like the the solid bright colors that you could kind of put next to one another that the bright pinks the purples the blues and things that could really catch your eye versus the other types of corals that i think are more popular today when people are just cranking up the blues in their tanks and and uh really trying to bring out the fluorescence in the corals but you know what to each his own right this is a um this is a hobby and people should should really keep the corals that they like not uh, the corals that other people uh you know necessarily say they should keep yeah and there was um i felt like i had you know bypassed go monopoly style a little bit too where uh because i started to get intense about this hobby right when the sps stuff was starting to take off um it got to a point where I looked back and thought, you know, when's the la last time I kept a track of you know, and it was 20 years ago. Um, I thought, you know, I'd never kept a Blastomusa, you know, um, or well, maybe I have, but I, do, I don't remember, you know. And so it's been fun having these different types of corals. So I still enjoy my little Acropora corner in my tank, but I still, then I have right below it, I have some Blastomusas, the Merletti and the Wellsy. Uh, no. Uh, what's the other one? The big one. Um, 
but you know, I just have a variety of those guys in the shadows of the acro. And then I have, um, you know, some, um, micro musas and, and the only downer is that regal angel, you know, he's great with SPS corals. He's great with softies, but I've, uh, you know, the, some of the fleshy corals I want to start keeping again, cause I, it's been a long time since I've kept them. Uh, I can't. And so that, that's how that second tank, the, which I call the angel free zone of, you know, sorry, I got something in my eye. Um, I, I keep, uh, I keep some of the fleshy guys in there. Uh, I don't, don't have to worry about it, but I, and I'm having a lot of fun with that. So, um, how, how big is, how big it. is that other tank? Yeah. Um, it's a, uh, I think it's 75 gallons. It's a water box frag 105, um, which is fun. It's shallow. It has very little flow in it. Um, I do ch- churn up the flow at noon for an hour, but the rest of the time it's almost like a tide pool. Uh, mm. and, uh, these big, you know, brain corals and I've got, uh, I've got some scenarinas in there. It's fun. It's like a look down tank almost, uh, for me. Um, I think I put a quick YouTube clip up, but it was right in the morning when the light was real blue and, you know, probably, probably not much to look at, but, um, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, all right, Mark, I, I think, um, you, you, uh, you might've mentioned it, uh, just before in terms of uh, SPS being, um, easy. And I, I think you also mentioned it on the, um, on your reef therapy, uh, podcast that it, it, it's kind of like, I guess not as challenging as, as, um, it was, for you at um, some point in time. So what, what, uh, what was like kind of like your methods in terms of keeping an SPS dominant tank? What was like your formula for, for success in that sense? Sure. And uh, let me preface, I'm not saying all SPS are easy. I, you know, I had a hell of a time with tenuous. Um, and you did say that on your reef therapy podcast, you were like, listen, I'm not like talking down to anybody that's having problems with SPS. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, green slimers, torts are pretty easy, right? Uh, most of the stags are pretty easy yep. once you get the conditions right. Um, table, a lot of tabling acros, uh, are tend to be, in my opinion, pretty hardy, but they're a pain in the bud. They turn into a giant umbrella and then nothing grows underneath them. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, I, you know, for me, I mean, nothing special. Um, I, uh, I was a big fan of, uh, Tunzi stream pumps. I used a, cal- a geocalcium reactor to keep everything dialed in. Um, some of the stuff that I find amusing uh, is, uh, and again, maybe that's why those folks can keep tenuous and I had struggled with them. Uh, I didn't worry about pH. You know, whatever the calcium reactor did to my tank uh, is where it was at. Uh, so my pH was always around eight. Um, and I grew SPS just fine, at least the ones that I like to keep, right? Mm-hmm. Um, halides for sure. I. I have never tried an SBS dominant tank with LEDs. I would be comfortable doing it now because I'm having even the acros in my tank under the Kessels are doing great. I tried LEDs, I think, a little too soon in their evolution. And, uh, um, you know, like I said, I went back to halides because I thought, okay, this isn't working. But uh, I've seen plenty of amazing led lit sps tank so i think i think we've turned the corner on that and i i would if i did do another tank i would love to try some of the more panel style leds because as i said earlier as much as i didn't like the quality of light the t5 fixture which was eight uh 80 watt bulbs that thing grew sps like bonkers you know it it made me uh forget about halides altogether um so um so I would say diffuse light is probably the best way to go just because those things love to shade each other as they grow, right? Um, but, I mean, it, it was a very simple recipe. I never tested my alkalinity. Really? My never dialed, tested alkalinity? I think it's crazy that people test daily. Um, multiple times. Not multi- the ones with multiple the automated. Time, multiple times. Oh, yeah. yeah, right. Just test kits daily, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, I hear guys on YouTube say they manually test with a Hannah checker every day. Um I think once you have it dialed in, maybe test once a month, you know, because you, more growth means more demand. Um, I, I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I'm a very lazy reef keeper. You know, I, 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 you're a minimalist. I always, I, yeah. I heard someone use the term once careful neglect. And I thought that's me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> where you neglect it, but you're careful about how you do it. You know, you're, uh, you, you don't, you don't harm the things you're trying to care for, but, um, so yeah, 
to me, that's, uh, I, I don't find them necessarily any harder. I, I do think they turn a corner for the worse quicker than yeah. say softies or LPS, right? So you really got to respond when that happens. But as soon as you fix it, they start growing again. So no, that's interesting. So, um, what would, uh, Mark, if, if you could like set up a dream tank, what would that dream tank look like? Assuming that you had the time to tend to that dream tank. Oh man, I would, like I said, I would love to do a real shallow reef crest with, like I said, those big fat corn on the, on the cob acros. Mm. Um, and then, um, uh, what was that? The Carlson surge devices, you know, have something like that happening, mm. but the salt spray would be a nightmare. Um, but yeah, just a lot, if I was doing SPS, I would do a lot of flow. Um, if I was going to go for the dream reef tank, I would want a mixed reef. I, again, I just keeping only one type of, or one group of corals to me would be kind of boring. Um, that's a tough question. I, I love fish. And so, uh, I'd probably go bigger, go with SPS simply because I can keep angelfish with them and mm -hmm. then keep a ton of different angelfish. I wish I could keep more angelfish, but my tank's not big enough. Would you do um, bare bottom or sand? Sand, much to Jake's chagrin. <laughs> I, I gotta tell you, I've um, I've been doing sand beds. You know, not deep sand beds, like maybe one or two inch sand beds, like more like around an inch. Sand, you know, sand beds. You know, for the majority of my reef keeping uh, life. But um, yeah. I did start the. Um, you know, the, the latest tank without a sand bed. And I got to tell you, man, I'm, I'm kind of digging the, uh, the tank without the sand bed because it seems pretty clean. I mean, it's, it's all SPS pretty much in that tank. And, um, you know, the, the cool thing is that I could put, um, you know, some larger SPS colonies that I've grown out on tiles on the bottom and not have to worry about them. Like just kind of like tip it over and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, the detritus just kind of collects in one spot in that tank. And every week, it's just really easy for me to kind of siphon up that detritus and, and just uh, to keep that tank clean. And uh, I, I never thought I'd be saying this, but um, I, uh, you know, I, I really do like a, um, a bare bottom tank, but um, it's not for everybody. You know, I love to keep wrasses too. And I know you can keep wrasses, certain wrasses in a bare bottom tank, but um, I kind of like the ones that, that like the burrow in the sand. Yeah, that 225 you uh, had a picture of, of that was that, that SPS dominant. That was bare bottom, and um, there's yeah, especially with SPS. I think if you're going to really crank up the flow and then not have any dead zones, then why bother with the headache of a sand bed blowing around? Or um, so so I can definitely I. I've talked to Jake about this too, and uh, his talk with um, Oregon Reef. I'm drawing a blank on his actual name, um, but oh, yeah, um, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, Steve Weist. You know, yes, thank you. Um, what he said is so true. Where I, I don't have, I, I although I had that deep sand bed tank you showed from 2001. Along the way, I've I, I don't necessarily see a sand bed as a filter anymore or a beneficial ad. I think it's a pain in the butt and something you have to manage. And I would completely agree with you that a bare bottom tank is much easier to keep. Uh, but I like the aesthetic of a sand bed, but it's something that you have to take care of. And you're going to have times when it looks like crap with cyano. Um, so it's, it, I, yeah, I, and that's just my opinion. I just don't see the need to add sand for any beneficial reasons other than providing habitat for wrasses. Um, so if you can go either way, go bare bottom, you know, um, I like having a little bit of a substrate. I, I have crushed coral, uh, mixed in with my upstairs tank, um, in those areas where sand gets blown around. And it's funny that my tangs treat it like live rock and graze it. Oh, really? So it actually stays pretty clean. Um, yeah, whereas, you know, they're not going to pick at tiny millimeter sand, but, you know, larger chunks. I, I wish that old school reborn media was still available because I would actually mm -hmm. use that uh, as a substrate. Um, because I, I think your tangs would just graze the algae off of that and keep it, you know, clean. It'd almost be like a, a bare bottom. I mean, you're going to get detrital buildup, but 
you know, that's what a gravel vac is for. I mean, there's so. there's nothing like a beautiful uh, sand bed, and and the uh, and your tank, the one we showed in terms of the video, that's that's a beautiful uh, sand bed. Any um anything that you do in terms of maintaining that sand bed, or you kind of let your cleanup crew uh, do the work. No, I, I don't think cleanup crews work either. Um, I, I think snails are great at keeping algae off of rocks. I, I love urchins, but um, you know, Nassaria snails and all of that and sea cucumbers, I, I don't think they actually keep your sand bed, you know, detritus free. Um, when it looks a little nasty, I'll go in and uh, gravel vac it. Uh, and then the rest of the time I leave it alone. Um, but, uh, and the other weird thing, this is not going to make any sense and I have no explanation for it, but I had a really bad run in with dinos and I know this didn't work for a lot of other people, but what worked for me was raising the temperature up to about 81. Oh, really? And the dino, yeah. And the dinos disappeared. And then I thought, okay, I'll drop the temp back down and the dinos came back. So I run my tanks at 81 degrees now and I don't get cyano anymore either. <laughs> so hmm. it's the weirdest thing. Uh, and then I, this downstairs tank, I set to 78 and then I had cyano, had a little bit of dinos and I brought it up to 81 degrees and the cyano went away and I thought, well, I guess I'm just sticking to 81 don't, degrees. Don't you so. hate it? Like when some of those things are just kind of like unexplainable and, and just, they, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the temperature seemed to play some sort of role, but you know, why, you know, why, why was that, um, working and yeah and why doesn't it work for other people i'd love to i'd love somebody else to have the same solution right it's like oh just run your tank higher warmer and you're not gonna have dinos and for some reason cyano anymore and but it doesn't work that way right i'm sure uh i'm sure there's 20 people that tell me like no that didn't work so right you know there's there's so many different forms of dinos out there i guess that's what the whole uh, trick is is to try to like find some sort of um you know method that works with you know, across all different varieties of dinos you know when when i had um dinos when i first started my um my peninsula tank i used a uh, uv and it and it knocked them out you know i had the free floating you know type which um you know i think is an easier type to deal with versus the uh the type that's not free floating but um yeah yeah uv didn't work for mine unfortunately um i, it, I put a, a decently sized aqua uv sterilizer on there and it you know nothing helped so i was glad the temperature thing helped um and i think a lot of old school reefers laugh or or, or downplay dinos like oh yeah we had those back in the day and you know you just black out your tank and I don't think they've dealt with dinos the way we deal with dan dinos today. I mean, that was that year I had them was miserable. I mean, just yeah, miserable. I shut, I shut, I, I pretty much shut my tank. I did shut my tank down because I couldn't beat them when I had them, um, about seven years ago, six, seven years ago, Rob upstate New York. Thank you so much, man, for the, uh, for the super chat. Cheers. Thanks Keith and Mark. Appreciate that. Uh, folks just to remind you that, um, if you, um, Want to hit that like button so more people can find the stream. That would be awesome. And um, questions are always encouraged. Uh, here's a question. What's Mark's thoughts on additives like aminos and other supplements? By Gouls. Gouls uh, is G-O-O-L. Gouls is asking that question. I I have a, a lot of faith in aminos. Um, when we first started getting red bugs, uh, on SPS. Um, and before Dustin Dorton, I think, yeah. uh, or revealed the, the grand solution of interceptor, um, aminos were like life support for my acros. Um, you would see them, you know, hold on. Um, so that showed to me that the aminos were doing something beneficial. Um, again, I am a lazy reef keeper. So I have a bottle of acro power that I occasionally pour in the tank when I think of it. I don't have it on a doser or on a regimen. So I, I couldn't speak to the sustainable benefits of dosing it, you know, in a more diligent manner, but I do have a lot of faith in that. Um, other than that, I, I haven't really found any other type of bottle to add to my tank that miraculously did anything. Um, the bacterial stuff is interesting to me. I know you've been messing with that yeah. a bit. Um, I did tinker with uh, Razor from... Uh, I use that. Um, yeah, I'm Bright using Wells. that on a little... Mm -hmm. 
pico tank right now that has a little bit of hair algae and um that stuff is interesting it makes your live rock look very very clean and freshly scrubbed over time yeah you know when, when i use that in my tank it uh it worked as advertised in terms of kind of like removing um uh what, what, what's the uh the word in terms of uh it's a it's a polymer right so it, it essentially um keeps stuff from kind of adhering to the rock and uh yeah, so I had a lot of uh, kind of gunk in my live rock, and and it and it definitely removed it. But uh, I've been having a hell of a time keeping frags on those rocks. <laughs> oh, really? And yeah, it's like man. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I don't dose it on my uh, my two bigger tanks, but I was you know, I have used it in the past, and I do use it on the on a pico on occasion. Um, but yeah, I, additives and trace elements. I'm I'm a little skeptical about some of that stuff. Uh, um, but you know, I do dose two part and that has a lot of trace elements in it. Yeah, so it I guess, uh, I guess that comes with the territory, but, um, yeah, I just, on the whole grand scheme of adding these different elements to color up corals again, I'm not really into SPS right now. So, uh, maybe I'm the wrong person to uh, have an opinion on it, but, uh, I just, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, I think it's a waste of money. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I've never really leaned heavily on aminos or coral foods myself. You know, I've, um, whenever I've tried aminos, I've had algae issues. So it's not something that, um, you know, I, um, I find to be a key to, to, to success in terms of having an SPS, uh, dominant reef tank. I think, um, I try to feed my fish a lot, you know, I really think yeah. that fish poop helps. And I think if you feed the fish a variety, then, um, that's gotta be beneficial. And, and I mean, I, you know, I don't think there's any proof out there that, um, well, maybe there is that, that fish poop is good coral food. Um, but that's kind of seems to be a good formula for me. One thing that has had me change my, I was a, I was a just feed your fish kind of guy too. But one thing that had me change my tune was again, going back to keeping some of these big fleshy corals and seeing the, uh, increasing growth rates in micromusas and, and then just seeing how happy trackies are when you feed them on a regular basis. Um, you know, those grow a lot slower. So there's, you know, I'm, I'm putting a human emotion on them, right? Saying that they're happy, but uh, they just look better. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I never fed my SPS. I never fed softies, you know, but, uh, and, and I have some LPS in that tank that I don't feed and they do all right. But I just, I started having some fun, you know, putting little pellets in the micromooses and, you know, all of a sudden there's another head and another head. And I thought, oh, oh really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's something to that, but, but that's target feeding a coral with a very large mouth, right. Versus these SPS. I don't know. Uh, I've never seen them, uh, eat a lot. So, so, uh, Larry and Nira net, thank you so much for the super chat. The comment or the question is Mark is so calm exclamation point. Does he ever get flustered? <laughs> yes. Ask my wife. <laughs> she, she would laugh uh, that somebody called me calm. So, <laughs> So you get, you got a good, uh, YouTube, uh, thing going here, right. In terms of the calmness on YouTube. Yeah, I guess, uh, I, I, I know you always see yourself different than other people see you. Right. So, uh, yeah. and, uh, I, I see myself as somebody that overthinks everything and my brain will never shut up. Uh, but I guess I, I don't show that. I don't know. Do you, uh, <laughs> do you ever have any, uh, reef keeping nightmares? Because I have one I could share with you, but I'm um, just kind of curious. Do you have any reoccurring nightmares with the uh, reef keeping related? I have a massive phobia, uh, about, uh, leaks and it started because not because I had a massive tank leak, but, uh, I had somebody come in and install uh, a new shower down here in the basement. And, uh, they accidentally, well, we'll just assume it was accidental, <laughs> threw a piece of the um, the handle to turn the shower on and off into the toilet flange, which was exposed because they had to pull the toilet out and never told me. And it clogged my main pipe to the sewer. And then, you know, over time, things backed up behind it. And then, you know, wife's doing laundry. And then one day I came down to the basement and just stepped into water. <sighs> and uh, the... Watching them tear all the drywall out, replace all the carpets, and going through that nightmare uh, scenario. As a reef keeper, the first thing I thought is, yeah, I can you imagine my reef tank leak. Like, this is what would happen. You know, this is what would happen in my house. Because, uh, you know, I, I would imagine 180 gallons is more than um, what a laundry machine trying to drain through a clogged pipe would do. <laughs> 
so yeah, I am, I'm so, that was another reason or benefit I saw to lowering the water level on there an already go. existing <laughs> tank is if planet said, Hey, this tank's fine with the water this high, right? Uh, shallower tanks have less pressure on the tank walls. So I thought, well, if I drop the water level of three inches, then the tank is technically overbuilt, right? And that gave me some peace of mind. No, that was very, so. very smart. So uh, my reoccurring nightmare, you know, I don't, I don't know how often I have this. Uh, it's an actual dream that I have. I, I dream that um, I have this tank that um, I keep forgetting to feed the fish in the tank. <laughs> and, and it's been like a year since the tank has been fed, yet... Whenever I like, you know, in, in the dream, I see the tank and the fish, they, they're still, I mean, there's a lot of algae on the glass, but the fish are still alive and they're still happy and, and what have you. And it's just like this reoccurring nightmare that I have, that I have this tank in my house somewhere that I always forget to feed the fish. And I feel horrible about the, you know, that's why it's a nightmare because I'm neglecting this tank. But um, I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess maybe I should go on a reef therapy and you guys can analyze that for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, you know, I wonder what that means. I um, don't know, man. It's a little scary. I had a, I had a lot of guilt when my pre-COVID, when my tank was in the basement and I rarely went down to the basement. I just felt bad. Um, and then when I moved the tank upstairs, uh, I told Jake, you know, I'd love to um, have a dedicated fish-only system with a clown trigger. I've never kept mm. uh, a clown love, trigger fish. Love clown triggers. Love them. Never had one, yeah, but, but I, I love the way they look. Same. Um, but I thought, you know, one of these days my company's probably going to make me start going more into the office. And then I would feel so bad for this highly intelligent fish sitting in a tank in a dark basement mm. with no attention given to him, you know? I mean, that, a fish like that deserves to be in a real busy part of the house, at least to, so there's stuff for him to see. So I, I didn't do it. I just felt bad. Um, but uh, so sort of like your dream. Like I would just think there's this poor fish in the basement, you know, wondering, you know, <laughs> what, what's this dark world out here, <laughs> you know, around my Very tank. lonely existence. <laughs> yeah. So um, a couple of questions for you. Uh, Chantra Bet. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. What's Mark's favorite corals? Mm. Oh, man. For the longest time, uh, for, I mean, long, long time, it was um, fungias. Um, I just loved that they were solitary corals living on a substrate, not attached to anything. Uh, and I had one of my very first corals that I bought was a fungia uh, back in the 90s. And every October it would spawn. And, you know, back in those days when reef keeping was still this crazy thing, it was just was fascinating that like clockwork, this thing would spawn. Um, uh, so these days, man, that is a really tough question. I'd say the most dearest coral in my tank is an orange herpolitha. Um, Vincent Chal Chalai, I can never say his last name. I suck at French. Um, he, uh, stayed with me briefly while during the, um, Fort Lauderdale Magna. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, he's a coral farmer in Indonesia and he, you know, we just sit around drinking beers and talking about corals. And I said, man, I always wanted an orange, you know, tongue coral, but man, you just can't find them. And, uh, it was just a random conversation thing you know i forgot about it and then i don't know six months later all of a sudden uh unique corals calls me up and says we've got this package from vincent that we need to ship over to you <laughs> and i was like what what is this and it ended up being a uh an orange you know herpolitha uh which i still have um so i'd say that's my current favorite coral just um not to not to uh, make Jake feel bad because a lot of the corals he's given me are favorites too, but that was just a funny uh, surprise. And I wouldn't have met Vincent if it wasn't for Jake. Um, but um, yeah, I'd say that's probably uh, one of my favorites. And I love, when it comes to Acropora, I'd say um, uh, Tortuosas are probably my favorite. That was uh, back in the day, like that was, you know, Purple Monster was hard to attain, but that was the first real... Uh, accessible hardy purple acro for me that was really just purple all around um so i uh, you know that that always has a special place in my heart my two favorites are the uh tyree purple monster and the or oregon blue torp <clears throat> i think those are uh just awesome 
you know, and, and uh, I, Purple Monster is not an easy one to find these days. I've never kept it. I've never been able to get one. So I've, I had uh, a Purple Monster colony um, years ago. Two of them, actually. I, I, I picked up like a small mini colony from another hobbyist that uh, I got a, a huge bargain on. I don't think the guy knew exactly what he was selling. And um, then I had another um, frag. And, and both of those, uh, you know, pieces of the Purple Monster just grew like weeds in my halide tank you know, and, um, wow. a lot of frags and all that stuff. And, and I've had, so I've got, um, I've got one piece in my 187 gallon tank. Well, in, in a frag tank growing out, I got another piece in my peninsula tank that's growing out. And man, let me tell you, it's a whole different story. I want, you know, they're just not growing fast. And, uh, it's bizarre to me because I'm not, I'm not doing a lot different than what I did years ago in terms of my reef keeping methods. So, yeah, you know, I just kind of wonder whether certain corals could kind of go through different, um, you know, stages in terms of, um, you know, growth or, or morphing in terms of different colors. You know, I've got an ORA red planet that um, is encrusting wildly, you know, on one of my tanks on a rock. And, and I, had it, I had the same coral back when it was first released years ago. And it's just tabled out like this, just beautiful tabling, bright red coral. And it, it just looks different today. And, I, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that it, it is the same coral because I know there's a lot of corals out there that are kind of getting um, passed around that get misnamed or misidentified. So maybe that's, that's a part of it. But um, it's interesting how that's kind of happened over the years that you have the same coral and you have proven lineage, yet it's behaving differently. Yeah, I had that same coral and it was, I, I always likened it to a Montipera where it just felt like it needed to encrust half your tank before it was going to send out a bunch of branches, uh, which was odd for an Acropora. But um, yeah, that that is a I, I, you mentioned that, and I just had I thought about that. I had the same experience where there was only a handful of branches, but it just encrusted the rock like crazy, almost like a digitata Montipera digitata does. So. So Chris uh, Meckley is telling me to stab it in the wool branch. And his uh, wife Amanda is saying, I see that guitar in the background. Does Mark riff for his uh, fish reef therapy theme song in the works? Question mark. <laughs> no, I'm a terrible guitarist. Um, I'm good at collecting them. Um, no, I, I do play. I just, uh, but uh, that's just another hobby. I like to noodle. Um, but yeah, that's, that's another expensive hobby, but you know, the nice thing is they don't die on you randomly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <So>. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can just keep it going for a while. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I, it, I probably show it. I've got, you know, a bunch of, oh, wow, <laughs> man, look at that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You ever play out in the, uh, you know, bars or whatnot guys, part of a band. Yeah. No, it's just a personal thing. Yeah. I, I thought about joining a dad band, you know? with my cargo shorts and go to like the local <laughs> pub in the, in the, um, subdivision area that I live in. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, and then you, you see those guys playing like all the music from their college days, you know, and then the crowd is a bunch of people the same age and it'd be fun. Uh, but, uh, I, I think my wife would be mad at me. I think she, I've got too many hobbies. And so, uh, you know, you got to scale I, it back more. Yeah, yeah, you know, I got to be around for those kids every once in a while. Yeah, no, <laughs> Play for sure, you got to be a good dad. Uh, on, yeah. on Orthodox Reef, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, question is, thoughts on chemical warfare between corals? Oh, man, yeah. I have heard so much about that. And, uh, oh, don't keep, uh, you know, these uh, type of softies with these type of stony corals, chemical warfare. I just have never experienced it, or at least I've never been able to attribute anything to it. Uh, and I'm horrible about replacing my carbon. Mm. Uh, before I started playing around with automated water changes, I was horrible about doing water changes. So I, again, you know, there were certainly SPS corals I struggled with, like tenuous and, um, oh man, the ORA pearlberry. I just never could keep that. Oh, coral really? alive. That's an awesome coral. Yeah. So maybe some of that was attributed to the fact that I usually had some leathers, but I mean, I recently got rid of a leather coral that was, it didn't fit, the, the crown didn't fit in the five gallon bucket. I had to piss it off so it would shrink up, uh, that I took to the local fish store and 
again, you know, a leather coral that was, I'd say about 18 inches wide on the crown, living in a tank with SBS corals, uh, no issues. So I, I, I guess I just, it seemed like an interesting thing to suggest and then it became gospel, but I mean, has anybody ever proven or isolated these, uh, these, um, you know, chemicals? I mean, the same was said about algae too, right? Uh, Calerpa, uh, releasing turpin, turpin means, what was the word they used to use? I forget, but I just haven't experienced it. So, um, but I mean, I hear a lot of people say mixed reefs are hard. Uh, and that's another thing I don't quite understand. Uh, maybe because I don't, turn everything up to 11 for the SPS and then wonder why my LPS corals are pissed off. I just <laughs> pick a happy medium in terms of par and flow and, you know, it all seems to come together okay. Um, so again, I'm not trying to say that in an arrogant way because I, I, you know, people have said that they struggle to do a mixed reef. It's better just to focus on one type of coral. And, and then I've heard people talk about chemical warfare. I just have never had problems there. So yeah, me, uh, me too. I, I really haven't had, um, too many issues with, uh, with that. You know, I, um, 187 gallon tank, you know, <laughs> it was started as an SPS dominant tank. And then I added a, um, you know, a few Ganeopora, some Alveopora and a couple of frags of zoanthids and those freaking zoanthids like just carpeted the bottom of that tank to a point where like they started creeping up on the rocks. But, um, they they haven't bothered the um they haven't bothered the uh you know the SPS encrusting montes I had in that tank that just essentially covered everything I mean all the rock is is covered with like zoanthids and encrusting montes and that's one of the reasons why I'm, I wanted to just do the uh, the reboot and just kind of like clean things up a little bit in in that tank but you know nothing it's it's been all kind of like gentle in terms of um nothing is pissed um, you know none of that stuff is like pissed off the uh, the acros which is which is good. Um, Chris from ACI is saying, I got a piece of pearlberry for you, Mark. So I guess, um, if, if you're ever ready for that again, I actually have three different, um, pearlberry frags in my systems or three different pearlberries, but only one is the genuine oral ray pearlberry. I, I was talking before about kind of, um, things getting misrepresented uh, or misidentified. And, you know, I, um, I picked up a couple other frags that I thought were true, genuine ORA pearlberries, but they were not, but I finally did, um, land a uh, an original frag and that that is just a spectacular looking coral just it all is. the different yeah. colors in that coral and and um you know when that thing gets happy it can really grow um pretty well and it's, it's got a really cool growth formation on it too yeah that is uh uh yeah I, that is a coral i'd love to try again um and you know again i obviously i struggled with certain types of sbs so i'm i'm not a, a master at it but uh yeah, there's, you know, the ones that you can't keep, it's always the ones you want the most, right? <laughs> it's uh, it's frustrating. Um, but then, you know, there were also a lot of corals, like Shades of Fall Acro. It's a beautiful coral. Uh, and that thing just grow, grew like a weed. But um, I, it, once it got into a sizable table, it wasn't that pretty anymore. Oh, you really? Know? You're bumming uh, me out, dude, because I got a nice frag that's looking pretty awesome right now. And I and, uh, was looking forward to kind of planting that. But I don't know. It could be a different experience, well, you know? Yeah, and it could have been my lighting, right? Maybe I wasn't doing the right thing to get the most color out of it. Um, as a frag, it was beautiful. But then once it became a big table, uh, you know, it just, um, the colors, uh, from, again, the, the across the room thing, right, that I've heard Vincent and Jake talk about. Yeah. Across the room, it, it just wasn't all that. Um, I'd say my favorite acro, my two favorite acros right now that I'm keeping are the Jason Fox Flame, which seems to be very hardy and very easy to color up. And then I've always liked the ice and fire echinatas. I just those are so cool. I've got um, I've got a Tyre ice fire echinata that uh, is is uh, is an awesome coral. And um, I have had the worst luck with the Jason Fox flame. And um, really, I um I I probably went through maybe six different frags. And now the you know knock on wood, the one I'm growing out now is uh, is finally happy and starting to flourish. But for some reason, that was like my Achilles heel. I could not keep the jason fox flame coral alive. is it weird how you know you'll be able to keep pearl berries i can't and then you know a fox flames growing next to a bunch of leather corals in my tank and then you have struggled with it it's just odd how 
these minute differences in whether it be our uh, setups or whatever, you know, can make such a difference. Um, yeah, you know, and and um, the other thing I was going to say is that, um, yeah, it, it's just it's it's really, um, you know, kind of a personal taste in terms of what you like and what you don't like. Um, you know, one question I see here from um, Michael Bazzi. Um, well, let's get back to Michael's question. One more, um, the other question I wanted to ask uh, you that, that another uh, viewer was was asking, what's your least favorite coral? Oh, man, least favorite. Oh, that's a tough one. You know, um, this is, uh, I hope Julian Sprung's not listening, but the uh, the Sprung Stunner, I hate that coral. <laughs> what is the Sprung Stunner? Um, uh, is it any kinopora? Is that, am I getting that right? Um, know. but it's, it's like a scrolling plating type of, uh, coral that is extremely aggressive, grows really fast. It just stings everything in its way. Um, I had a colony of that, that I would just hack back. Um, uh, yeah, I want to say it's echinopora, but somebody will probably correct me. Um, it's a neat coral. It was very different, but it just, it grew too fast. It had a type of growth pattern that would, you know, take out everything around it. And then it stung the hell out of everything. And so I hated that coral. <laughs> um, no offense to Julian Sprung. I know because it's named <laughs> after him, but uh, I think there's also a Hollywood stunner. Yes, um, that's a cool looking coral too. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And uh, I like... Um, I like some of the plating type of LPS, of course, um, you know, like uh, the chalice corals. And I think the stunner is also considered a chalice, but it's not the same genus. But I do like chalice corals, but they just they grow into these giant plates and uh, they're just hard to, you know, once they get to a sizable um, size, they, they're, they're just hard to fit into a small reef, uh, in my opinion. So uh, but I do like them. Uh, so, but yeah, the sprung stunner wasn't worth it for me. <laughs> so John Wright is asking me the same question. What's the worst thing you introduced to your tank? Um, so the tub stiletto montipora is an awesome, beautiful looking, um, you know, coral. And, uh, you know, it's if, if folks are not familiar, it, it's got these uh, bright green polyps and kind of like a purple um, skin. And um, that thing spread like wildfire in my my tank to the point where it was just like encrusting on everything and it was just taking up so much <laughs> real estate. And, um, I, I love that coral. And I think anybody out there that's looking to fill up some real estate and wants an easy coral to keep, that's just gorgeous. Then that's, that's a beautiful, uh, coral. So, you know, that was like a pretty aggressive coral. I think years ago, you know, I, I, I had a green Valley slammer in, in my tank and, uh, I loved it. You know, I like you, I love staghorns. But it just dominated, like the one side of the tank oh, yeah. that that it was on. And in fact, it actually like was growing out of the water. It was so crazy in terms of the growth on that uh, and that coral. So I kind of like always vowed never to put another Green Valley Slimer in my tank because it just would would just grow so quickly and and take up so much um, space in the tank. But that's not to say that other people shouldn't um, you know be gravitating to great corals like that because. Um, you know, like I, I made the comment earlier that there's nothing like a, a beautiful, mature looking reef tank with large colonies. Um, so it's just a matter of what you're into. And I think that's, that's something that we're not seeing a lot of these days. Yeah. And, and I don't want to discourage people from, um, from doing that. So yeah, it, it just depends. You know, funny story with uh, Green Slimer. I have a I have a friend who's a freshwater guy, and he's really into African cichlids. And I finally convinced him to set up a 90 gallon reef tank. And you know, we set it up pretty good with auto top off and his RO DI units all set up and automated. So uh, it's relatively easy for him to care for it. And uh, we threw some T5s over it many many years ago. And then I gave him a bunch of uh, frags. You know. And I hadn't seen his tank in ages, you know, I just, we, we always meet up and we go running together, but I, I just never go to his house. You know, we usually go meet up at a bar or just hang out somewhere. And then finally he had a birthday party for one of his kids and we dropped by 
And I think it had been six, seven years since I saw the tank. And the green Slimer and the Tortuosa that I gave them just had taken over the entire tank. Mm -hmm. And there were all these little coral atolls on the surface yeah. where it hit the surface yeah. and then just turned into like a little land island. Yeah. And I, it was, and it had hit the front of the tank and the sides of the tank. And it was, it was really cool looking, but it was like, man, I, I guess I'm getting this guy some pruners for Christmas, you know, <laughs> some titanium or stainless steel because it just bone took cutters. Over. Yeah. Bone cutters. That's the word I was looking for. It just, um, it was funny. Um, but, um, yeah, he just let it go, go crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, Melanie, thank you so much for the, uh, for the super chat. So I want to get back to, um, uh, Michael Bazzi's question, Mark, what is your favorite angel fish and what are some angels you would like to keep? Oh man. So I'd say my all time favorite is the emperor. Whoa, uh, yeah. and I had one in a reef tank for a while and he turned into a nightmare. Um, and then I went, uh, on a trip to, uh, South Africa and eventually to Mozambique and did some scuba diving. And that was the only place I've ever been where they're you know, scuba diving where there's emperor angelfish. And then I saw them in the wild and I mean, they're just gigantic, you know, and I just said, oh, I can't keep that fish anymore. Uh, I mean, I'd already rehomed my emperor to a guy with a 500 gallon tank. Wow. So, but I just said, I, I can't get another one of those. Um, I'd say from a reef keeping perspective, my all time favorite is the regal angel. Um, Me too. and that Me too. was again, a I mean, you probably remember this. There was a time where, I mean, you pull up old fish books. They were like, those are, those things are, were considered, uh, nearly impossible to keep alive. And then people started to figure out that the yellow bellies are hardier. Um, and then of course, keeping them in reef tanks is a whole different story. But, um, if I had, let's say a, a large Andrew Sandler, is that his name? Style tank yeah. or something, you know, yeah. um, I love, uh. Yeah, I, I love the Pomacanthus genus. I, I would have another emperor. Um, what's the one from Kenya? Uh, man, you don't see those guys around anymore. Um, Chryseris angels. Okay. Um, that's a gorgeous fish. Um, my holy grail is, uh, well, my, my real holy grail is a resplendent angel, um, which is a pygmy, but you just, you're just you never going to get them. I'd rather keep that probably than a peppermint angel, which probably sounds crazy. Um, but my attainable Holy Grail is a uh, conspiculatus. It's just, I can't spend three grand on a fish right now in my <laughs> life, you know, <laughs> and, and stay married. That is, um, but that's, I love conspics. I think they're beautiful, um, in person, you know, I mean, they're beautiful on the internet, but when you see one swimming around in person, that's full grown. Oh man. Just, it's, yeah. it's a big investment, right? I mean, I, I've never spent that kind of dough on a fish, you know, I think the most I've ever spent is, um, maybe three, $400, maybe $500 on a fish. Um, yeah, I don't, not, maybe not 500, but, uh, I, I, um, my Holy Grail, I found actually somebody was, um, selling a Miss Bar Regal Angel fish nice. and, um, I just, I, I, I don't know. I just kind of like had it in my head. It's like, I need to get a Miss Bar Regal Angel Fish. I just really want one bad. And that, and then, you know, that, that had been like something I'd been seeking out for years and years and years. And I finally found one. Somebody uh, was selling one in New York City. So I, I bought it and I had to drive like five and a half hours each way oh, wow. to like go get it. But um, it was completely worth it, um, you know, to me. And then, <laughs> then when I, when I put it in the tank, I had this like major disaster in the tank where I had a, uh, an overdosing event with the, um, um, the nitrate supplement that I was dosing in the tank. It was ammonium nitrate that, um, essentially I had about 800 mLs that just by accident, um, siphoned into the sump and oh. I lost like, um, I think about half of my fish if I'm remembering uh, correctly, but the, uh, the regal survived. And that was like two weeks after I had put the regal in the tank. And, and, um, you know, thank God I see that, um, uh, reef keeper said my LFS had a huge, beautiful regal yesterday for 90 bucks. Wow. I wanted it so bad, but not wanting to risk my coral. Yeah. I mean, I, I find them to be pretty, um, pretty gentle. You just, like you said, you can't put them in, in a tank with any meaty, meaty corals, or if you have zooanthids, I, I guess I should probably put one in my, uh, my tank with all the, uh, the zooanthids that I want to, uh, get rid of, but, um. I was going to say they're, uh, yeah, they'll mow your zoanthids down. Um, I find them to be relatively reef safe. And I know that's, uh, you know, I guess the question more is, are they coral safe? But, um, 
to me, they're worth uh, not keeping certain corals. You know, it's just uh, working around them. Um, another angel that I actually tried to go see in the wild in South Africa um, at uh, Aliwal Shoals was, and I saw a, a, an Orthodox reef is in the chat. I know he has one, is the uh, King Eye Angel. Um, I did not see one. I went diving. I didn't see a single one. I was pissed. And then uh, many years later, Jake went and he saw like a buttload of them, I think. Uh, but uh, I didn't see any, so I was a bit bummed. But the, um, sorry, not to, I go on tangents, as you probably can tell if you listen to the Reef Therapy <laughs> podcast. But then I, those, the guys I dived with, uh, you know, I, I was having some sinus headaches and stuff. I had a, a minor cold and they felt bad that I, you know, was not having a great time. So they said, uh, you know, South Africans are the nicest people. They're like, why don't you come with us to Mozambique? And so I said, okay, you know, I barely knew these guys and, uh, um, figured out a way to join them. And we went to Mozambique and we camped in these tents and I love camping. So I'm like, this is great scuba diving and camping. Mm. Um, and we went diving in Mozambique and I remember just looking around and all of a sudden the gem tanks went by and I, oh, and that, man. that made up for it. Cause it was, <laughs> Uh, you know, they're, they're known for being in Mauritius and I, I think Madagascar, but not, you know, not on the African coast, but I guess, uh, this guy hitched a ride and, uh, somewhere. And, uh, so that was cool. That sort of made up for not seeing the King eye, but yeah, that's another angel I would love to keep. Um, so, and I think they're worth, uh, I, I, I we talked about this on retherapy. I, Jake's more passionate about the corals that he's not willing to let a fish get in the way with that. Whereas I am more on the side of the fish are more exciting to me. And, um, angels are cool because they're fish that are smart and have personality like a pet fish, but they're also beautiful. So to me, they're worth the sacrifice of a few corals. Um, and I, I don't really like zoanthids. You know, you always hear horror stories of people getting poisoned by them. Yeah. Uh, so I don't keep any zoanthids. Um, and he, uh, I mean, I have blasted mooses with my regal and he doesn't touch them. Really? Um, yeah. I think the bad guy in my tank is my flame angel. Cause I had a tracky in there and somebody was pecking on him, but I think it was my flame angel, not my regal. Um, but I, I don't have proof of that. So, so your regal doesn't touch the clams. Nope. Mm -mm. Wow. My emperor did, uh, when I had oh, yeah. an emperor for a while, that thing. Yeah. I couldn't keep. I couldn't keep micromooses with them. Yeah, he was, but he was more pet-like than the regal. He would uh, grunt at you when he was hungry, uh, make croaking noises. But man, uh, he got pissed off after a while. He had a chip on his shoulder after a while. <laughs> and then when you see one in the wild, you're like, ah, yeah, a six-foot tank probably felt terrible to him. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I would, I would definitely put a regal in my 187 gallon tank to kind of take out the, uh, the remaining zoanthids. But I got this, uh, gorgeous, uh, acanthophilia, you know, coral in there that, uh, I'm sure would be like, you know, on the dinner menu. Yeah. That's not a cheap coral. I wouldn't gamble that guy. That's, I can see. Maybe I just I need to well, like start another tank or something like that to, uh, to take care of that. Somebody's asking me if I would ever consider a fish only tank. You know, I mean, personally, I do love uh, I do love the fish, but I, I I also love the corals, and I'm probably more of a, a coral person than a fish person. And I don't pay enough attention to my fish in my tank. You know, I, I kind of feel bad about that sometimes in terms of like not watching the fish as much as I probably uh, should because uh, they're um, they're beautiful animals and they got some great personalities. I mean, I do love the uh, the flame hawkfish. Those things are like hysterical to me. Yeah, every tank needs a flame hawk, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, I. What I don't understand about fish only is um, I feel like you could probably, if you if you do set up a fish only with some triggers and angels and whatever, you could probably throw in some sacrificial frags of different corals and find corals that they're not interested in and have essentially a mixed reef, you know. I, I would, if I ever did a fish only, well, not fish, it wouldn't be fish only at that point, I guess, but if I ever went for fish that I wouldn't, trust in a full reef tank i i'd be throwing mushrooms in there sinolarias leather corals and just seeing what sticks right what uh what are they not chewing up uh, especially with butterfly fish and stuff and i think you could eventually build a pretty cool backdrop of corals that they just don't care about yeah so uh mark one um 
One question I've, I've asked a lot of my guests is, um, you know, kind of the, um, you know, the evolution that they've had as a reef keeper, you know, I've, I've, um, I've been in the hobby a long time. You've been on the hobby a long time. And, and, um, you know, over the past few years, I have certainly changed some of the ways, uh, that I, uh, you know, tend to reef tanks. Have, have you evolved at all in terms of your reef keeping methods? Is there anything that, um, you know, you've been doing like the first half of your reef keeping career that you're not doing now, or is there anything, you know, recently that you started to do in terms of the way you, um, you know, keep a tank? Um, hmm. I, I was, uh, I was one of those people that tried to get away without water changes for a long time. Mm. And I had pretty good success with that. Uh, I'd say the most recent thing is just out of curiosity now that the, I'd say the technology, but the, the, the maturity of the dosing systems and the, um, you know, apex and all of that has come to a head where I, I was able to set up an automated water change system. I just mm. figured it was worth That's, trying. That scares me. Does it? Yeah, it does. I don't, uh, I don't do what most folks I guess do where they change a gallon or two a day. I just, um. I just made it essentially a, a water change, but with a push button. And then um, on a weekend where I know I'm not out of the house too much, I just, you know, I push the button <laughs> and let it do its thing. Um, I, you know, you saw my sand bed from 2001. I, I don't, I, I, I love to romanticize reef keeping methodology. So I've tried it all. I have a inland aquatics turf scrubber mm. in storage. I tried the Jobert method, the real one, you know, where you actually use crushed coral in a six inch bed. Uh, I've definitely tried it all. And, uh, you know, one thing, like I said earlier, I don't feel like a substrate is uh, worth the, the squeeze sometimes if you're looking at it from a uh, filtration or nitrate reduction plan. Um, but I do like, I'm willing to deal with the headaches of a sand bed because I, I like the way they look. Um, I, the two part stuff, I I've done that like everybody else, but, uh, I really don't see the need to do a calcium reactor for a mixed reef. Um, I think they're great if you have a very heavily populated SVS tank, but, um, if we're going to spend 300 bucks on corals, you know, on frags, like, please don't argue to me that a calcium reactor is more cost effective than dosing. Yeah. You're right. But we're not here to save money, and I feel like dosing is foolproof. Uh, you don't have to sit there and try to figure out how to bring your pH up because you're you're not dumping a bunch of CO2 in your tank. Um, and I think the other point is, you know, dose uh, two-part solutions have different concentrations, right? I mean, uh, ESV, if you look at, uh, I use Brightwell now. Brightwell is four times more concentrated than ESV, mm. and I'm I'm not sponsored by anybody on this stuff, I just, um, that changes the, the cost analysis a bit too, right? Uh, I don't have to dose as much, but I just think dosing is great if you can get away with it. Um, but I also understand that, uh, you know, a calcium reactor is the way to go. Um, I saw somebody ask, do I still run a refugium? And, uh, I do, and I can't, this is another one of those things that I cannot explain and I don't want to get into, coming up with reasons why I think they're great. I just noticed that when I run a tank with a refugium and Jake's doesn't like calling them refugiums, right? Let's call it a colerpus scrub or whatever. Like we always joke about that, but uh, our macroalgae scrubber, I just notice more stability in tanks that I do that. Um, I know you recently pulled your Cato and, and yeah. went full bacterial dosing. Yeah. Um, so Again, that's just me and my personal experience. I, I've tried going without it, and then I throw some algae in my sump and throw a light on it, and just something happens where things just sort it themselves out, and uh, there's a level of stability that happens that I cannot explain. Yeah, you know, I, I, it's uh, it's something in terms of the tank and and the um, the. Uh, you know, I, I think also a lot of it for me is is the corals are exporting a lot of nitrates and phosphates. So I think that's why I was also able to kind of mm -hmm. get away with pulling out the Cato. But um, I do, you know, I do believe in the uh, the bacteria dosing in, in terms of, I think, having some sort of hand in that uh, nutrient uh, control. So, oh, I, I'm sorry, don't interrupt. 
this so the tank in my basement does not have a refugium uh and i out of curiosity added a um a filter roller i've never tried one of those oh. and i am not one to have ever used mechanical filtration i did never use filter socks or any of that crap and but i really like this thing i don't know it's just um it's great it's uh I, I'd be willing to try one of those instead of a refugium, but, uh, you know, why don't mess with a good thing and the upstairs tank is doing all right. So for now I'll just leave it. Yeah, no, for, for sure. Like if you're on cruise control, then, um, there's uh, a lot of reasons not to mess with what you're doing. If, if, um, if the formula is working out, um, all right, dude, I think we're going to, uh, I think we're going to wrap. I'm going to be respectful of your, uh, your time and, um, any uh, any final thoughts there, uh, Mark? You want to um, pass along? No, I mean, um, I uh, obviously I, I try to reinforce that I'm just expressing my own opinions on things, right? Uh, but um, everybody, you know, there, there's there's so many ways to skin a cat when it comes to reef keeping, and everybody finds a recipe that works for them. And I I think there's something to be said for that. I think. Um, you almost have to pair up your personality with a methodology. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, me and Zeovit would be a horrible combination, right? <laughs> um, even if I was still hardcore SVS. But um, I think the other thing too is, uh, I, I, you know, mixed reefs, I, I definitely at least want to echo stuff for that because th there's plenty of stuff out there to talk about SVS. And I hope at least um, folks that are going more, simplified or not, I guess it's not simplified, but more just, um, lower key reef keeping. I, you know, I, I try to be a little bit more outspoken about, you know, doing stuff for that. Cause I, I think everybody knows what it takes to run an SPS tank, but I, I imagine a lot of people that are getting into the hobby or just wanting to set up something. Um, you, you said it to Greg Carroll, I think last week, you know, buy what you like, wear what you dig. Yeah, um, exactly. We're, I, yeah, exactly. I, I think that's important, man. I, I think keep the corals that you like, you know, and uh, set up the tank the way you want and, and just enjoy it. Yeah, it's um, it's a very personal thing. So it's, you got to like, you know, but you, you got to run your reef tank, the, what, what, you know, whatever makes you happy, right? Whatever kind of, you know, you want to run, run a lot of blues and run a lot of blues. You want to keep, um, you know, um, certain types of corals or designer corals and if that's your jam then that's uh that's perfectly fine you know i i think it's important not to make any judgments on people in terms of um you know their their taste i mean this is a a day and age in terms of social media and instagram and i think things do get a little bit over the top in terms yeah. of what we're seeing on on social media so um i think you also have to kind of take that sort of thing with a grain of salt because that was not um present back when i first got into the hobby and i guess when you first got into the hobby so that's uh certainly changed a lot of things and and um but yeah i think i think uh very very wise words mark in terms of um this is not this is not a complicated hobby per se you know i think you could really kind of get caught up in the minutia in terms of chasing numbers, in terms of having all these, you know, gadgets to run a reef tank, it doesn't take a lot to run a successful reef tank. It really does not, you know, and, and I think if you're dedicated and consistent with what you're doing, then you'll have success. Yeah. No, I agree fully. And I, I think you're always going to have the people that push the envelope and, you know, hey, what happens if I tweak my pH? And, and that's, really good for the hobby, right? To, to always bleeding edge, try new things. But sometimes I worry that people see that and then they start to treat that as gospel, right? And say, and, and that's where I kind of go, well, you know, pH is a good example. I mean, when we were all running calcium reactors for the last 20 years, we just took it in stride that our pH was eight, <laughs> you know, not 8.3 and things were okay. Um, they probably were better at 8.3 had we done all that tweaking, but if you're, you know, buying CO2 scrubbing media and you start to do all this stuff and then all of a sudden your tank looks like a science project and you're not having fun anymore. Yeah. And just remember that it, it wasn't really necessary in the first place to have a nice tank and enjoy it. So, yeah, for sure. All right, dude. Well, listen, thanks, Mark, uh, again, for uh, for taking the time to be uh, on the live stream tonight. Really enjoyed our uh, discussion. 
And please, folks, check out uh, Jake and Mark and Reef Therapy. It is uh, well worth the um, the time spent listening, watching, however you consume that uh, content on YouTube or all the uh, different uh, podcast uh, providers. I also want to thank um, our sponsors for this live stream, Bulk Resupply and Ecotech Marine. And I also want to thank all you folks for tuning in and the, uh, the Super Chats. Really, really appreciate that. And finally, a big thank you to Paul, the moderator. I also want to uh, let you know that all episodes of Rapping with Reef Bum are available as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Stitcher. My next live stream will actually be a live choral show that I'm having on YouTube this Saturday, nice. June 4th. Yep. I, I got a lot of frags, Mark. I got to get rid of I got a lot of frags from that 187-gallon reboot. We didn't even talk about rebooting tanks and stuff, so we'll have to uh, have you come back and talk about reboots. But, uh, yeah, so I'm having a live stream this uh, Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, up to 40% off on the frags. So I'm, I'm trying to move them out. The uh, next Wrapping with the Reef Bum live stream will be on Thursday, June 16th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Chris Wood from Captive 8 Aquaculture. So that should be another great discussion, and you can check out the full upcoming schedule of Rappin' with Reef Bum on reefbum.com under the YouTube section. So until then, be safe, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Keith. Thanks, Mark.